first, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to be talking about, and thank you for the introduction, Mary. Um, I'm going to be talking today about mentoring junior engineers. And uh, it wasn't too long ago that I was a junior, that I'm a, almost just above a junior engineer. And um, I think Slack has done an incredible job of empowering me to continue my love of engineering without feeling like an imposter. Um, so I hope that um, you'll take some good tips for your team back. Um, but first, a little about me. Um, I'm a, currently a application engineer at Slack, which uh, works on the back-end web application. Um, and I work on our enterprise grid um, software. Uh, I've worked on, um, and previously I was a musical theater actress, um, and I've also worked in the nonprofit realm, working dead human trafficking. Um, so the overview of my presentation today, I'll talk a little bit about how I transitioned from acting to software engineering, um, and the importance of the promise of mentorship played uh, in my ability to feel confident and grow as an engineer, and how important that was for me when I was joining a company. Um, and I also want to talk a bit about what I think Slack did really well, um, and take some of those key best practices that I think made my experience of men mentorship so effective um, that you might be able to take to help optimize your own junior engineers. Uh, and then I'll take a little bit of time to talk about the role of engineering culture and why I think um, having an engineering culture that is conducive to, or, or what the elements are of an engineering culture that are conducive to mentorship. So this is me on graduation day. Uh, I had no idea that I was ever going to be a software engineer. I came from a family of artists. Uh, I've spent my entire life from the time I was, uh, I would say, five till the time I was in graduating college toward one goal. Uh, it was working as a professional actress. And I spent years studying ballet at a professional level. And uh, at this point, so you, uh, this day, I had no idea what a terminal was. I had no idea that in a few years I'd be working building software. Um, it wasn't an easy transition. Um, after working as an actress professionally for a few years, um, I started to teach myself how to code. Um, and it didn't come completely naturally. Um, I had to, to try a few times. It took me, um, and I learned mainly through going through Code Academy, and I realized from doing Code Academy that I wanted more structure. Um, and so I started working towards going um, to afford a boot camp. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Hackbright, Hackbright is a software engineering fellowship in San Francisco that um, is w for women. Um, they accept uh, a very small percentage of applicants, and it's a 12-week intensive that um, focuses on uh, empowering uh, women to uh, build their own web applications and enter the workforce as a software engineer. Um, for me, I ended up doing two 12-week coding intensives. Um, I did one in New York City uh, through Code Academy Labs, and I did uh, in addition to Hackbright. And through this, I uh, discovered a love of computers and a drive to master the craft of software engineering. And I think that my background in ballet, um, I knew that the importance of having a strong foundation. Uh, in ballet, at a professional level, you can only go as far as the strength of your basics. Um, and I knew that, um, and as I was researching how to, the software industry, I read about, I read, I remember reading a post about how, um, 
how software engineering and programming is, is a craft. And I knew what it was to learn a craft. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And I knew that if I could keep working at it, I might be able to actually work as a software engineer. But uh, <laughs> junior engineers are listening to the horror stories. Uh, you know, when I, as I was finishing up Hackbright, I, I knew <laughs> that I was going to be facing a tough industry. I was hearing the stories about how women were treated in the industry. I was hearing the stories of, you know, I, I don't look like the stereotypical software engineer, and I didn't know if that was going to help or hinder me. Um, and I think that these stories are, I, I think it's important for mentors to know that these stories are in the heads of junior engineers, whether they're just out of college or transitioning from another career. And imposter syndrome really does start before the job. But despite the bad press, Working in tech is incredibly empowering. Uh, it's changed my life. Um, even though it's a tough industry, I would argue that it's definitely not as tough as theater, which is probably why I was able to make the transition. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was used to being rejected. <laughs> I was used to telling pe people will tell you you're not good enough. Like, or you could be good enough, but you know, you're a dime a dozen. Uh, I remember going to auditions in New York, and you know, every <laughs> there'd be a line of girls that all looked exactly the same, and all could sing exactly the same, and it was just sort of a crapshoot. So, you, if you want to be in that industry, they tell you you have to have tunnel vision, and you have to kind of have a thick skin. <laughs> no, you don't have to kind of. You do have to have a thick skin, and you know. I think that was why I was able to transition, but there are so many people with potential to be great engineers that are being scared away from the industry. And so we really do need to work on building cultures of empathy and inclusion so that we don't lose talent and potential. I knew for me, coming from a non-technical background, that mentorship was going to be really important. Uh, I knew when I was looking for jobs and interviewing, most companies promised me mentorship. They, but, and they promised my friends mentorship. But in reality, if you're a small startup, sometimes it's not always easy to follow through on those promises. There's other priorities that can come up that you need your senior engineers <laughs> to work on your features, not teaching teaching someone, but I think that it's a choice, and your engineering culture is going to play a big part in how fast your engineers are going to ramp up and their ability to, to feel safe enough to make mistakes. And I'll never forget when I was interviewing for Slack. I was a, uh, I had a few interviews, I had, I had one offer in hand, and I'll, I was in my last interview with, with Cal Henderson, Slack's, um, Slack's CTO, and I sat there trying to pitch him that, you know, my years of ballet are actually going to make me a good software engineer. I, <laughs> I spent, I, I worked for two years teaching myself how to code, and I found a love of computers, and I was looking for a place to develop my foundation. I wanted a solid place to develop my craft. And I could t see the moment where he was starting to entertain the idea. And he looked at me and he was like, yeah, we'll grow you as an engineer. <laughs> and I was like, awesome. <laughs> Um, and they did. Today, actually, in less than a year of working there, I was working as a feature lead on our international billing systems, on a, working with a cross-functional team, designing, implementing, and building a 
feature that ended up bringing in millions of dollars to Slack. Um, and I still love engineering. I love going to work every day, and I am hungry to learn more. And I think that's a huge accomplishment as far as Slack's culture is concerned. Because if anyone was vulnerable to imposter syndrome, it was me. And I felt like an imposter very few times. So when I reflect on my year, or year and a half at Slack, I've thought, like, what makes Slack a supportive environment? And what made my mentorship experience so effective? I had friends who went into the industry, and they did have the horror stories happen to them. And I, I think that Slack has been very thoughtful about the way that they are building a culture of empathy and craftsmanship and solidarity. And I think that um, in the next few slides, I'd like to, to explore the things that my mentor and I did that made the experience effective. So I think the one thing to remember is that mentorship is a relationship. It's no matter, even if you have a mentorship program set up, you, the quality of the experience is really going to come down to the relationship between the mentor and the mentee. And a lot of that success <laughs> hinges on uh, developing and, and getting those expectations out in the beginning. Figure out if you're a good fit before it's too late. And I think the most important thing, before you even get to coding, when you have a new mentee, take time to ask questions and get to know them, and listen, and ask yourself questions. You know, like, how do you prefer to be communicated with? What does a good mentorship relationship look like to you? What are your goals? And for your mentee, what are their goals? Where do they want to be in a year? And what do you expect from your mentee? Be specific. You might even want to write these things down. I think encouraging self-reflection in your mentee and in yourself is very important, particularly with strengths and weaknesses in terms of technical ability. I know for me, I tried to be very, very transparent about what I knew and didn't know. And, you know, I knew that I came from a boot camp, I, I am going to be weak on the computer science theory, potentially, um, and I asked straight up, <laughs> how can I improve these areas? Help me. And, you know, I, I didn't know much about unit testing. These are uh, potential uh, questions that you want your mentee to be asking. And I think, most importantly, the mentee and the mentor should be focusing on, on what their communication style is. And think about what your communication style strengths and weaknesses are. For me, I would also tried to be very direct with my mentor and my manager. Please don't sugarcoat my feedback. <laughs> I, like, I, wanted, I want to be better. I knew that I wanted to be, in a year, an engineer able to contribute independently. And I wanted to be the best engineer that I possibly could be. And that's not for everybody. Um, and I think that being really self-aware as far as what you, like maybe you're a shy person, maybe, maybe you're outgoing, maybe have, what feedback have you been given about your communication style before? Are you, have you been told you are shy and, and maybe came off aloof? That's something that you might want to communicate to your mentee so they don't misinterpret your actions as they're doing a bad job. I think another thing to think about is learning style versus teaching style. And communicate it. You know, what is your teaching style? Are you someone that is going to throw them into the fire 
and expect them to help themselves and, and learn that way? Or are you someone who really wants to sit down and, and pair program together? What, do you, what, kind of, what does your mentee expect? How do they learn the best? What can you do to work together to make this relationship work well and develop a plan? And I think the other thing, sometimes junior engineers, whether, especially if they're right out of college, they may not have thought about any of these questions. And they may not have thought about what it means to ask a good question. And I think it's important to know your tolerance for certain types of questions and how you might communicate what you expect when your junior engineer is in their learning vulnerable phase. Uh, and I think clear expectations for every junior engineer that I've talked to, um, clear expectations is something that I think mentors and mentees and managers struggle with. And I think that my mentor did a particularly good job of, of setting this up. But something to think about is, you know, what, what is it that would, what does success look like for you to a junior, about a, your junior engineer? What do you expect them to be proficient at from three, six, 12 months from now? And what does it mean to be a successful mentor? How will you evaluate your own success? Maybe you should write these down. Share them with your mentee and, and develop a sense of respect and mutual uh, and collaboration in this relationship. And one thing that my mentor, this is actually a screenshot of what my mentor and I worked on to develop regu through me regular meetings and setting concrete goals. Um, by creating regular meetings, in my first three months, mentorship was not restricted to whenever I had a question. In the meetings, they took on more of a free-form structure that were able to adapt to my learning. We set concrete goals for the quarter and reviewed how I was doing every few weeks. And by setting goals together, I was held accountable to my success. And when I was struggling, I was able to work in a very specific way with my managers for tactics for how to address my weaknesses. And we tracked my progress. Uh, and I think tracking progress and acknowledging success was huge for me in far, as far as not getting in my own way about and, and, feeling, like a, and, and feeling like an imposter because I knew that I was on track and I was accountable to myself. And, and, there was, and my manager was very transparent about you know, what the feedback was. It was in writing. And another really important part is, of mentorship is code review. This is really where your engineering culture plays out. And I think that Slack has done a really great job of creating a code review culture rooted in empathy and respect. And, you know, in the beginning, when you're working with your mentee, you want to be a resource for questions, uh, an advocate for best practices, and you want to communicate the coding standards and documentation for your company. Um, I think that this is a great example of communicating the expected documentation and standards for your company in a, in a respectful way, um, which is something I really would like to emphasize, that your tone goes, aware, goes a long way in pull requests um, or in, in uh, peer reviews. Um, being able to talk to your engineer in a way that makes them, that respects their intelligence, that comes through in these little interactions. And if you can root your lessons in, um, 
in something and state why it's important. Um, it will enable your, your junior engineer to take the feedback and also see with gratitude that you are there trying to help them be, better and be a better engineer. And I really appreciated that about my coworkers at Slack, that they really, I was lucky in that I didn't have, I, I didn't have to work with anyone. I, I was expecting to have to work with people who would make me feel stupid, who would, you know, maybe not have the best people skills. And I tried to prepare myself for that. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that people were trying to respect my intelligence, even if it was, I made a mistake. And something that my mentor Eric did is, you know, when we would talk about, uh, we would review my code, he would ask questions in a way that took my opinion into consideration. And sometimes we would, like, a, uh, a conversation like this would lead to us pairing for ten, maybe 10 minutes. Sometimes, and having room for these impromptu learning sessions really made a big difference for me. Pair programming, I mean, pair programming isn't for everyone, but by working together and, and, and trying different uh, strategies out and, and being flexible with regular meetings, um, there's a lot that uh, I, I was able to, to excel uh, much faster. And one thing uh, I think Slack really emphasized from the beginning is the importance of empathy in pull requests. And as you can see from the examples before, I think through hiring uh, people with intellectual humility and, and, um, and courtesy, things that are core Slack values, um, that was present in almost every review that I got. And I think that it's important to be aware of your emotions, um, when, especially when you're reviewing a new, a new coder's uh, output. It's, in, in real life, deadlines are happening. You have a lot on your plate. Mentorship falls on the shoulders of senior engineers. And being able to step back and, and realize when you're having a gut reaction of why the heck did you just do this stupid thing and waste my time, to, to reframe it. Why did they think this way? How did they get to have some curiosity about why they made that decision? And ask them. And then maybe by thinking through that, you're giving your engineer a chance to, to refine the way that they think about problems and find, maybe discover the issue themselves. Instead of, and that's taking the time to, to have that opportunity to really give people that, that chance um, to think for themselves is, is very empowering. It's, it's the mo those are the moments where you have the influence to empower your engineer to love what they're doing or make them feel stupid. Mistakes are learning opportunities. And one thing I think is important in the beginning uh, is to really have a trajectory in mind for your junior engineer. And I like to, to think about the six month stretch when you're not new anymore and the expectations are higher. And this is generally when imposter syndrome really creeps in. I know it did for me. And you know, the junior engineer is struggling with, you know, am I approving at the appropriate pace? And like, I think I know what I'm doing, but I might suck. I really hope I don't. And the demonstrated belief in, the, in potential through code review and and your direct interactions can have a big impact. Um, and I think another, a, a way to demonstrate that belief is by giving your engineer a stretch project. Um, and what defines a stretch project is something that is 
more autonomy than you are comfortable with in a project with relatively high visibility, and something that introduces a real potential for failure. For me, this is a visual representation of my stretch projects. <laughs> um, as you can see, like the little uh, I worked on enterprise search. That was my first stretch project. Uh, I we didn't have a search team yet, and that was my manager straight up told me, "You might fail at this." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, that's awesome." <laughs> um, but it ended up going okay. And the next project I worked on, they gave me the opportunity to actually be a feature lead on our sales tax project. The billing team was new. There was only two of us. And I got the, it was a big, a big ask. But it changed, it, it really helped me grow as an engineer at an incredible pace because I was given the opportunity to design the APIs. I worked with a cross-functional team. I worked with an external team. And my manager encouraged me to be the leader. And as a result, I was promoted within a year and have continued. And here I am today. I've worked on search. I've built our enterprise um, Billing systems for sales tax and Dunning. Um, I've worked on our, I built our HIPAA compliance, and currently I've been working on our mobile device management for enterprise. And this is one of my favorite quotes, and I think it's particularly relevant for mentees and mentors. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Fail again, fail better. Don't be afraid to let your junior engineers fail. Give them something that feels scary to you too. And that's when that's when we learn the most. And I think that in order for these mentorship lessons to to really thrive, you need to it really is dependent on your larger engineering culture. And I think Slack has done a really good job of creating a holistic uh, engineering culture when it comes to thriving. Um, creating growth infrastructure for the people in your organization. So for us, like we have an opt-in professional development fund. We have an opt-in uh, personal development fund, which means that you don't get the funds unless you use them. Um, and I've used this to take classes at Berkeley for, like, I took a, a Linux class at Berkeley. I took, um, I've been continuing to supplement my education and with online courses um, th for PHP and, um, and JavaScript. And I've given brown bag presentations. I go to brown bag pres presentations that happen every week where engineers can share their ideas and, and exchange knowledge. Um, and we, even, we do have uh, non-technical workshops as well. And by providing resources and opportunities for us to learn and make ourselves better engineers and citizens of the world, Slack has built a positive culture of learning. And we also have had uh, office, hour, and office hours with top engineers. Um, and that's been something that I've taken advantage of as well, that has made a huge difference. Now, I know this is like mortal sin of presentations to put a blob of text, but this is something that I wrote in a blog post about engineering for the Slack blog that's gotten highlighted so many times that I figured it was worth the sharing. I won't read it out for you, but it's something that I think really that Slack's built a culture of learning instead of a culture of academia. And I think it's something that tech as an industry needs to be aware of. Um, we're an industry that's saturated with elite degrees. And something that I think can happen is that intellectual um, academia 
intellectual arrogance can be um, arrogance can be mistaken for um, for intelligence. And too often, individuals with privileged education confuse intelligence for aggressive arrogance. And while in reality the best ideas should win, when it becomes a battle of the brightest mind, it under undermines individual morale. And oftentimes it's just all of us overcompensating for weaknesses or insecurities. And those actions can directly or indirectly make your coworkers think you're making them feel stupid. And the only way to avoid this is through the people you hire. Slack has avoided hiring arrogant people, and I know that in a lot of interviews, like if someone comes off as intellectually arrogant, like they may have tons of experience and be a great fit, but if they're going to be toxic to the people around them, no one wants to work with them. And I have the one way I would describe my coworkers at Slack is they're incredibly humble, hardworking, and eager to share their knowledge. And they were hired for their humility and craftsmanship. And by being surrounded by people with the values that Slack, uh, that Slack's values, I've been able to thrive because people, because I've been able to, um, I've been able to not feel stupid. <laughs> I've been able to feel supported, and I've been able to make mistakes. And um, I think that most importantly, I've been encouraged to develop a growth mindset. And you know, when I've made mistakes, no one's gone out of my way to make me feel incapable, and I think that says a lot in itself. Uh, and uh, so my key takeaways are, you know, mentorship is a relationship. Um, set clear expectations and, and make the time. Give your senior engineers the opportunity, make it a job requirement. Set goals, track progress, and acknowledge success. And take off the training wheels. Um, and make sure that you're, engineering, you're building an engineering culture where intellectual humility is a core value and that you're building each other up. Um, and, and by encouraging a growth mindset and having an environment where that mindset can thrive, um, you can accelerate your junior engineer's output and effectiveness um, in a great way. So thank you. I appreciate your time. And if you have any questions or feedback, this is the first time I've given this presentation, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, reach out to me on Twitter or uh, other things that have handles, like, and I'm always Carly as red hair. And uh, you can also reach me at carly.codes. At carly so thank you.